GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome to Headliners, the show in which two top comedians look at tomorrow's papers with very often amusing results. My name's Mark Dolan. I'm your host for the next hour. Before we meet tonight's panellists, we go to the news and reading it tonight impeccably is my fabulous colleague, Polly Middlehurst. Thank you. I'm Polly Middlehurst in the GB newsroom and your top story tonight. Aaron Bell is the latest Tory MP to submit a letter of no confidence in the Prime Minister today. He said he struggled to reconcile assurances Boris Johnson had given him about the Sue Gray report and that the gatherings held in number 10 made the Prime Minister's position untenable. It's reported so far 17 MPs have submitted letters of no confidence, but 54 are needed to trigger a vote of no confidence. Well, this comes as another senior advisor to the Prime Minister resigns. Elena Narazansky is now the fifth aide to leave her post in Downing Street. It follows the departure of Boris Johnson's chief of staff, principal private secretary and director of communications. Policy chief Minira Mirza also quit yesterday, blaming Mr Johnson's refusal to withdraw his claim that Sakir Starmer failed to properly prosecute Jimmy Savile when Sakir was director of public prosecutions. In other news tonight, seven men have been jailed after a plot to sell on an array of lethal weapons was disrupted by the National Crime Agency. Our Home and Security Editor Mark White has this report. This is the moment the law finally caught up with Umar Zaire, a Manchester drugs dealer who bought deadly firearms to enforce his criminal trade. Also arrested by the National Crime Agency, another member of the gang, Bilal Khan, Protesting his innocence, but this is Bilal Khan just days earlier, his head deliberately obscured, posing with an AK-47 he'd just bought. Sayir clutched the same weapon, showing off in another picture. As well as AK-47 assault rifles, Scorpion and Doozy machine guns, handguns and ammunition were all up for sale on an encrypted online site used by criminals across the globe. Robert Brazendale, who helped supply the weapons, was arrested after he fled to Malaga in Spain. In total, seven organised criminals, including drug dealers and gun runners, have now been sentenced to a combined 81 years in jail. Mark White, GB News. 
Well, in happy news this evening, Her Majesty the Queen has been looking through nostalgic gifts and cards from well-wishers ahead of a weekend that's going to mark the start of her record-breaking Platinum Jubilee year. The display was at Windsor Castle and included a golden jubilee letter from a nine-year-old boy called Chris entitled Recipe for a Perfect Queen and a fan presented to Queen Victoria marking her golden jubilee in 1887. During the photo sheet, though, the monarch's beloved dog Candy pictured there interrupted proceedings by making a lap of the room and greeting members of the press. Royal Zoomies at Windsor Castle. On TV, online and on your radio via DAB+. You're with GB News. Now it's time for Headliners. My thanks to Polly Middlehurst, who is off to the pub. I'm Mark Dolan. This is Headliners, a rapid-fire romp through tomorrow's newspapers in the company of the reassuringly expensive comedians Nick Dixon and Leo Kirst. Gents, how are we? Leo, what's going on? I'm good, thanks, Mark. How are you? Ignoring the weather as always. Yeah, well, we're inside. We're inside. When I go outside, I'll put on a jumper and a jacket. I'm, I'm not, not worried about you getting COVID, but pneumonia is a distinct possibility. <laughs> I think you're a pneumonia denier. <laughs> well, I think some people, some people would say it's the same thing. So, well yeah. said. Well, pneumonia, a bit of a worry. I was arguably, fine, I was, arguably worse than Omicron. I was fine with the old pneumonia. There you go. You take that any time. Nice. Uh, that was that was a pun on multiple levels. Yes, which is obviously never off. That's what you're paying for with the cash. I know, I know. I'm, it's, it's a thrill to be here, Mark. A little bit disappointed to be on with Leo Kirst and give a platform to his unacceptable hate speech. But yeah, apart from that, that's exactly I was going right. to boycott, but I thought I'll just I'll collect the, the cash. And yeah. it'll be a good way to sort of give wider context to Leo's misinformation. Yeah, that's right. And also, as we've <laughs> learned from a story about Jimmy Carr, which we'll be discussing later, please, whatever you do, as comedians... Don't make any jokes, because okay. it <laughs> oh, might end your career. Remember, it it's 2022. <laughs> Comedians, no jokes. Welcome to hell. This is Headliners. Clues in the title, so let's give you tomorrow's front pages. Let's start with the Daily Mail, which leads with health officials in the office just four days a month. And Tory Pierce's bombshell book says Carrie is to blame for number 10 chaos. Is it all the fault of Erin Dawes? Can you say that these days? I just did. The Telegraph leads with British Gas, who are sorry for leaving homes in the cold. We'll discuss that shortly. The Independent has isolated PM, struggles to regain his grip on power, and Beijing Games open under shadow. I don't think they mean a tall building. The Guardian goes with PM ever more isolated, as he attempts to rally team, all three of them that are left. And the FT has Bailey accused of pay rise hypocrisy and Xi and Putin unite on NATO. What a chilling headline that is. The Mirror leads with cops handed picture of Prime Minister with lager at number 10 party. I'm confused. Is that worse than wine? What's the latest? And the Times has civil war in cabinet as PM told to sack Sunak. And those are your headlines. Nick Dixon, Boris Johnson, should he stay or should he go? Great question. Is it down to me? Yeah. Shocking. Uh, Number 10 are uh, watching. They've tuned in. <laughs> the Prime Minister's got you on a flat screen. He's opened a bottle of Pinot Grigio. Do you know what? I'm actually with uh, Peter Hitchens on this. I actually... Said no one ever. <laughs> I, think I, sort of, I sort of now want him to stay. because maybe I'm, just a, maybe I'm just a contrarian, but because he actually got us out of these restrictions, I sort of partly suspect this is all, like Hitchens said, revenge for that. And I actually almost want him to stay. I know he basically can't stay and he's in massive trouble, but part of me, I just care about getting out of these restrictions permanently. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. But, I mean, yes, he's not well, doing... Well, I agree. I've been defending... Boris, since the start of the pandemic, because it's clear he's a lockdown sceptic. And for me, the flashes of genius in his premiership have been when he followed those instincts. So that would be Freedom Day on the 19th of July, which was condemned by Keir Starmer as reckless, but cases fell. 
and keeping the country open over Christmas. Yeah, and I don't know how much credit he deserves or if it's just that he is swayed by his backbenchers, but I will take either just to get the, the freedom personally. That's my personal view. So I know you, you, you'll take sort of a politician with no political... No spine. Uh, as, long as, <laughs> as long as they're bullied by the right people. That's exactly it. I'm a pragmatist on that. No, I'm so militant about getting out of restrictions that I've become yeah, a bit of a pragmatist on that. But I know, you know, a lot, he's, a lot of people are angry with him and he, he's basically has to leave. I mean, this story is that um, erratic Boris Johnson offers MPs say on policy in desperate bid to stave off coup. So basically Boris has resorted to quoting the Lion King in an attempt to, <laughs> in an attempt to stay. He, he says he tried to put a positive gloss on the stock clear out of, of senior officials by quoting the Lion King saying change is good. And some people have said, well, this just proves he's, he's not serious and uh, is not the right man. And some people have suggested he should do a John Major and call uh, a vote now, of no and, and probably he'd still have an, the, the confidence. Sack me or back me is, yes. is uh, which sounds like a procedure you'd have at a tanning salon, doesn't it? But uh, <laughs> I, I think it's a political manoeuvre. The thing is, I mean, if you're going to invoke the Lion King, you've got to ask yourself which characters these politicians are. I mean, is Rishi Sunak the evil Uncle Scar, <laughs> or is he just the annoying... Little parrots. He's the he's the little one who gets lifted up like that. I haven't seen it, but I've seen the poster. I don't know that happens in it. But I, I mean, it's it's quite it's quite risky for Boris to quote from the Lion King since lion sounds so much like lying. Nice, That's true. Yeah? The lion King. That's, right. That's what Donald, Donald Trump it's, would call it's, him. It's lion a triggering King. word for him, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, to be fair, you know, like uh, Chris Patton, the former Tory chair, has branded him a, a moral vacuum. Uh, but we sort of knew Boris was a moral vacuum. We knew he lied all the time. But he, he's a fun moral vacuum. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I'm surprised it's the, the parties that seem to be the thing that, that's taking him down. The, you know, the parties yes. that had when everybody else was locking down, when they told everybody they had to lock down. Because in my mind, it's the billions wasted on dodgy mm -hmm. COVID contracts. The, you know, they're creaming off so much money. Michelle Moan, you know, siphoning off public funds to some company controlled by, allegedly controlled by her, by her husband. Uh, there was Owen Patterson from the Randock scandal and all these things are coming, coming to the surface. And this is billions and billions of pounds of taxpayers' money. So for me, that's, that's a far bigger offence than having a can of lager with some, some workmates. And many people would argue it's the restrictions that were the crime, not the parties. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, so we're getting angry about the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. And in a weird way, letting them off the hook, <laughs> which seems to be the narrative of all outrage these days, is that, you know, you've got these focus, these groups who want to unseat someone, but yeah. there's a really specific line of attack. Yeah, yeah. And he, and he seems to be going after the wrong target. So, um, so uh, Munira Mirza uh, walked out because uh, she was upset. They, they went after, um, went after Keir, Starmer over, Keir Starmer over Saville. Starmer mm -hmm. was head of the CPS and allegedly didn't you know, prosecute Saville or didn't, didn't push for that. But you know, all the while then and still now, the spectre of grooming gangs hangs over the Labour establishment. They obviously you know, let the grooming gangs slide, you know, just turned a blind eye to it for, for so long. So for, for uh, Boris to, to go after Saville instead of, instead of that, to bring up Saville instead of that was uh, quite a strange move. What do you think is going to happen? Does Boris survive this storm? No, I think he's been he's been mortally wounded. He's now lum he's lumbering around like a like a wildebeest that's been bitten by a komodo dragon. So right. the, the bacteria is late setting yeah. in. Probably in the Lion King. Liz Truss is going to come along in a tank and blow his head off. It's, you know, I hate to see that. It's funny as well, in how you often see the prime minister that seems to age a lot during the job. Boris Johnson seems to have dumbed down. He started off like quoting Homer's Iliad and stuff. Now it's <laughs> Disney. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Disney movies. What's That's that? it. Well, he's apparently drawing up a speech for next week based around Hannah Montana series one, <laughs> which, by the way, is unmissable TV. As is this. Let's be honest. Let's move on to Saturday's Telegraph. British gas customers facing weeks without working boilers, Leo. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a really, really sad story because obviously we're in the depths of winter right now. Yeah. It's cold outside. Uh, people in, in Newcastle are staying in their T-shirts, but it's still cold outside. But British Gas has been forced to apologise, uh, suggesting that it didn't want to apologise. It's been forced to apologise, had its arm twisted to hundreds of thousands of customers over its failure to fix and service broken boilers this winter. So the energy giant promised to improve its customer service after failing facing criticism for its new policy of allowing staff to work from home several days a week. So it looks like this policy of allowing people to work from home, uh, and as we all know, work from home is a euphemism for 
not do very much uh, is is resulting in uh, in a poor service. So people people's boilers aren't getting fixed, and this is coming right as energy bills are about to rise by seven hundred pounds on average in April. That's a record jump of more than fifty percent because of the government's appalling green policy. I mean, some of the stories in this uh, are, are shocking. So Anthony Vickers, a data analyst from Basingstoke, has been unable to run a hot bath for his children for over a month because of a problem with his boiler. So uh, I mean, if you do go to school with them, be sure to bully them. Yeah, uh, exactly. You can smell those kids a mile off. I mean, this is a double whammy, isn't it? High energy prices if you're lucky enough to have a working boiler. Well, exactly. Yeah, it sort of it makes me think it's like a glimpse of the future the WEF wants. Just, you know, in your house, freezing cold with your rubbish heat pump, eating bugs. You know, you're freezing, yeah. own, nothing, own nothing, and you're, yeah. you're happy. Watching you videos of Prince Harry talking about me time. Yeah, and self-care. <laughs> no car, just a, just a state-appointed electric vehicle that you're allowed on Tuesday afternoon. And uh, government-approved comedy? Yeah, oh, Absolutely. which is which is coming. I mean, that's one of the stories coming The up. face of which I can't imagine you will be, Leo, I've got to say, <laughs> which is why we love having you on this show. No government-approved comedy here, and we'll be talking about a big story involving Jimmy Carr shortly. It is explosive. You won't want to miss that, especially getting the authoritative view of two top comics that are with me. Now, on to Saturday's Mail. Health officials have been told they need to be in the office just once a week, Nick. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot for you, by the way. Oh, yeah. I try and do once every month. But, this, you know, we're, we're comedians. We don't really do anything. But, yes, it says the policy <laughs> was revealed by a junior minister who said civil servants were moving to a new model of hybrid working. And apparently it's a hybrid between working and watching Netflix. <laughs> um, look, they work hard. I know people in the civil service. They, they, they do work very hard. But, yes, some people are saying this is a, a bit much because they'll only be in the office, what is it, what, what, four days a month? And uh, Ian Duncan Smith says it's a bit outrageous given that... Doctors and nurses still have to be on the front Is line. Is it because they're worried about bumping into Ian Duncan Smith? <laughs> That's part of it, I hear, yes. Um, That's always the risk, isn't it? Oh, no, there he is at the water cooler. It's, <laughs> it's IDS. That's why we should have stayed at home. I think he's all right. He's quite a principled chap, isn't he? I'm only kidding. I love IDS. <laughs> In fact, maybe he could be a great prime minister. Yeah, he'd That'd be a great a comeback. comeback. He used yeah. to be the leader of the Tory party. The yeah. quiet man. There you go. You could turn up the Never volume. underestimate the guy. Uh, but, but look, I mean, this is a big question, isn't it, about how things... Are. I've got lots of viewers, or we, we've got lots of viewers here at GB News, who actually appreciate that they can work from home. It means that it solves childcare issues. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's better for the environment and potentially for their mental health because they've got more time for leisure. Yeah, and it's more relaxing because you don't do as much. It's, there's so <laughs> is that, is that a fair accusation? No, well, I used to do, work... Do at... some people work harder at home? Arguably. Yeah, I mean, no, that, that's fair as well. Um, so, you know, some people, they were, and also there's not that boundary between, you know, home and, and work. So yeah. you end up working into the evening and stuff. Yeah. But I mean, I, I used to work in the public sector and we did nothing. We did, that's the, the essence of the public <laughs> sector. It's a Keynesian stimulus. Uh, we've allocated money to, state money to these people uh, to do nothing uh, except, you know, uh, get involved in people's lives and, and make it worse. Uh, so we, we did nothing, but at least we did it in an office. We got clothes on, we got on a bus and we went to the office and we sat there on Facebook instead of just sitting at home on Facebook. And you so, went to Sainsbury's local and you bought a meal deal at lunchtime. Supported local economies. So, you know, at least we, we did that. I think this new, uh, new thing where you, you're just paying people money to do nothing at home, um, I, I, I don't like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I look, I, I think that's the, it's the economic imperative of getting people back to work. Because the issue you've got is we can romanticise working from home and that's no problem, but it's an adjustment for the economy. Yeah. And an adjustment equals less money. Yeah. It's, an adjustment is a posh word for an economic shock, isn't it? Yeah. Because, I mean, think about all the businesses that are based around offices. Yeah, exactly. And also, what about commercial property? Yeah. You know, you've got these massive office blocks that have got mortgages on them. Who's yeah. going to pay that? And 90% of the uh, fund that you have at home is based around masturbation, which doesn't generate any income for... Uh, I'm right? not sure that Nick Dixon has the energy for that kind of thing. I'm just stunned that we... we are we allowed to say that? Is that going to be another big fine, yeah. off-com fine for Leo Kirst? No, you're allowed to say masturbation. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad you said it twice then. Yeah. Um. <laughs> you just need to have the energy to actually do it. Yeah. Speaking as an exhausted father of two. <laughs> father of two. Masturbation moment. No. Here you go. Live and unedited, <laughs> as I think we've just proved. <laughs> Lots more of that to come. You never know what's going to happen on Headliners, the show that makes its own headlines, if we're honest. Now, we're going to take a, a short break, um, but scrutinise them, please buy their products and fund this great news network. Then join us for part two, in which we'll be chatting about Jimmy Carr's most controversial joke to date. People are calling for him to be canceled. 
plus breakthrough cancer vaccine trials and an angry farmer who flipped a car with a forklift truck. Easy for you to say. See you in two. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate. From all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories. Make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel. Right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Great to have your company. This is Headliners, an unfailingly entertaining romp through tomorrow's papers. Tonight in the company of the double comedic threat of Leo Kurse and Nick Dixon. Now, Jimmy Carr has found himself at the center of a storm due to a joke in his latest Netflix special. Apparently, Leo, no laughing matter. Well, apparently not. It's upset a lot of people. Uh, we're not allowed to play the clip uh, or say what the joke was. Um, but I mean, you can see it. You can see it online. It's, uh, I, I watched the clip. I thought. Can I do it to you in like? Can I say it in French or something? Yes, yeah, say, it, say it in French or Sanskrit. Please say it in Sanskrit. I mean, look, I've Please, would you I've read Sanskrit? this joke several times. Yeah. And it's a joke about the travelling community yeah. about gypsies community. in relation to the to the Holocaust. Yeah. And I guess that's where we'll leave it. Our viewers uh, have enough gumption to find yeah. find the clip online. And it, it really this works. Is what I mean, wait Jimmy until the Carr. end of the show. Wait yeah. until the end of the show. But it's online, and you can see it. And it, it works as a joke. You can see it, it, it crushes in the in the in the room. Like it gets a huge laugh. And uh, it works as a joke because he's wrong footing the audience. You expect him to go one way. And he goes another way with a really, you know, sort of sick twist. Because it's Jimmy Carr. He's famous for being... It's a, it's a disgusting, outrageous joke because that is what Jimmy Carr does. Jimmy and Carr by does. the way, he's joking. He's joking. This is the thing that nobody seems to... The Labour MP and Nadia Whittam uh, has, has oh, written... By the way, Netflix. very good stand-up, Nadia. <laughs> oh, yeah, knows, knows a lot. I've seen her absolutely storm the, always, the comedy store. Great closer. the comedy clubs. <laughs> and, um, yeah, she's, she's written to Netflix, a.k.a. ran to teacher urging the platform to remove Jimmy Carr's latest stand-up special, uh, which has been heavily criticised, in, in the wake of an online backlash where people have obviously just clipped out, you know, the, the words, uh, completely shorn of any sort of delivery or nuance or context, or, you know, just, just the fact that it's a comedian in a comedy club telling comedy jokes to people who've paid, tic paid for tickets to see comedy. So the whole thing is obviously comedy. It's not in any way some sort of political rally. Uh, you know, the, um, the other people have, have, uh, have written to Netflix to, to remove his, his uh, material. And they've also requested... How do you write to Netflix? Have they got, like, a postal address? They will do. Well, they've probably got an email because they're all, you know, high-tech now. 
So probably. Yeah. I mean, do you think Netflix but... will take any any notice of this? Because I thought it was great the way Spotify stood by their great talent, Joe Rogan. Well, what might happen is uh, so they're they're pushing for uh, streaming services to be brought under Ofcom regulations because obviously GB News and channels like this are, are governed by Ofcom yeah. regulations. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't know it watching this show. <laughs> well, we can't say certain things. So we can't. We Did can't... you know there's a picture of you at the Ofcom offices? <laughs> <laughs> Just smiles Just benevolently down. <laughs> Nick, Go what on. do you think about yeah. this? You're well, going to look. condemn Jimmy Carr and have him cancelled. Yes, he should be cancelled, absolutely. It's a appalling <laughs> hate speech and I've had enough of it. Um, <laughs> look, Zara Sultana, MP, said Jimmy Carr's joke, uh, she put it in inverted commas, and then she said how disgusting it was. It doesn't really work just to put a joke in inverted commas. It was a, a professional comedian at a comedy show. Do you know what I mean? It's like... Yes, it is actually a joke. Just because you put it in inverted commas doesn't make it not a joke. What an absurd line of And attack. this is, by the way, somebody very censorious deciding what a joke is and what a joke is not. Right, I mean... And that in itself is scary. Whether you like the joke or not, you can't deny it's a joke. He's at a comedy show, there are people laughing, it's on Netflix under the comedy section. So that's quite important. <laughs> then she says, mocking racist genocide has no place in comedy or a decent society. Now, call me a hater, I think we probably should mock racist genocides. Do you know what I mean? I'm against them and think they should be mocked. She's saying mm. you can't mock genocide. Well, of course you can, because that's the whole point. We, we mock things that we don't like and things that are serious. That, that's how we get comedy. The problem is, with her line of thinking, you'll have no comedy in the end. Now, I do want to give the other side and say, if you're in the traveller community, which the joke is kind of aimed at, you probably do get sick of being the butt of the joke all the time. But that's why we have to joke about everyone. Mm. You know, and there is something in his joke. It does reveal that that is one group that you can still mock. So there is something, like when he mocked anti-vaxxers recently and exposed that that's actually a group you can get away with mocking. Mm. And I actually hated that joke. But I don't think he should be banned or I'm not claiming that it's not a joke. You just have to take the heat because you're in that one victim group. Exactly. But the point is, as long as everyone's a victim, that makes, makes exactly. it a level yeah, playing field. You can't laugh for 45 minutes and then suddenly get offended. Right, because, right, right. You know. Well, didn't that happen to Frankie Ball, who I think we can all agree is, is another brilliant comic, just like uh, Jimmy Carr. You know, not to everyone's taste, but both of them great joke writers and very popular performers. And I think that somebody sat through a, an obscene hour and a half from Frankie Ball until a particular illness was mentioned that a family member of theirs had, and suddenly they walked out. Yeah. It's like, you can't have it both ways. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and some people deliberately try and get offended. I had somebody come, somebody wrote an email to a comedy club that I perform at, oh, yeah. uh, and they said, I came to see Leo's show in July, and it was horrific and offensive. I came back to see it in October, and it was still horrific and offensive. Can you ban him, please? And, and it was, was like, why don't you... Unacceptable. Yeah, unacceptable. That's the word you always get. Yeah, I believe that was a comedy, comedy critic from Time Out, wasn't it? <laughs> I, said, I said to Leo, why can't you just be acceptable? <laughs> <laughs> like everyone else. It's Can't so, you be a bit more yeah. vanilla? I mean, yeah, look, be like me. This guy's going home in Super a Bentley slick. tonight. Yeah, but yeah. People see, people see, you know, where do we draw the line? We draw the line where people don't laugh. People laugh at that joke. It made it onto his Netflix special. It clearly works as a joke. And look, I mean, uh, okay, I'm, I don't particularly explore uh, comedy around the gypsy, Romany gypsy traveling community. It's not in my act. I've not heard either of you do it, but I nearly see this as a test case for free speech. It is. Uh, you know, it's not about the detail of the joke, it's the principle that nothing is off limits in a comedy environment. Yeah, because where do you, otherwise, like you were saying, where do you stop? I mean, these, some of these MPs would simply have no comedy. That is the ultimate end point of this, because yeah. otherwise you're in that thing of picking and choosing, and this is the subject that offends you. Even Judd Apatow tried to do it to Louis C.K. He had a joke about school shootings, and Judd Apatow said, well, you can't joke about that, because I know about that subject, and it Rubbish. bothers me. Rubbish. Right. Whereas yeah, we must joke about school past. shootings, because they're so tragic, and the way that human beings survive horror mm. is to laugh at it. Um, anybody uh, that wants to have that confirmed should read an account of the First World War. Mm. Yeah. And in the trenches, there was gallows humour because that's how our young soldiers survived. Absolutely. I think Freud and even said laughter is uh, something about relief at the thing you've survived or something like that. A half-remembered Freud quote for you there, but he was absolutely right. And worryingly, there's actually the possibility of Jimmy Carr being prosecuted uh, for this uh. joke. So under the, under the same legislation, the, the Communications Act, Section 27 or something, I'm not 127. aware. 127. 127. Um, so uh, under that, you know, Count Dankula and various other people have been <laughs> prosecuted for telling jokes uh, if they're transmitted over an electronic medium. So there is the possibility of somebody reporting Jimmy Carr to the police. And yeah. maybe we need a test case to, to roll back this terrible legislation. Definitely. I stand with... With Jimmy Carr, um, I'm curious what you all think about that. That's clearly going to be a debate that will rumble on. I've got no doubt it will be raised at breakfast tomorrow morning, mm. of course, uh, and across our outputs throughout the day. So uh, good news, Nick, on a vaccine for cancer. 
Yes, a rare, a rare Provax bit from me. Um, <laughs> just kidding, guys. Just I playing. believe you've agreed, to, you've agreed to be in the experimental trial for this one, is that right? Absolutely, I'm first in line for these. Oh, there you go. But yeah. So it's BioNTech cancer vaccine trial hopes to do something magic. So yes, they're, they're talking about the difficulty of, of tackling cancer, obviously, but this vaccine would kind of, it would, it would train the body to attack tumors in future. So it, it would kind of learn how to attack them rather than just you know, performing surgery and getting rid of it it would be able to recognize them in future. That's the big change they're trying to get with this BioNTech vaccine. I just hope it doesn't have any nasty side effects. But yes, it's great. No, the you, vaccines don't, works. none of them do. That's They're 100% right. safe. You're right. And if you say another word, you, you'll be locked in a special room here I at GB I believe the news. vaccines are 100% safe. But this is good news, isn't it, this one? So I mean, look, it raises a good point. Technology. Our tongue-in-cheek remarks about the vaccine mm -hmm reflect a tension that people have now, Leo. Yeah. Which is that because of things like vaccine passports yeah. or vaccine mandates, for example, in Austria now, a law has happened, which means you will have to have the vaccine. Yeah. Uh, we've kind of crossed the Rubicon, as they say. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, when people hear the word vaccine in the future, they'll be more suspicious than they previously were. Yeah, which is a bit of a shame. They've been tar it's been tarred, almost sort of uh, politicised and made a partisan issue, which, which it shouldn't really be. And uh, like, really, the issue isn't with, with vaccines. I mean, if you look at the truckers in Canada that are protesting the vaccine mandate, 85% of them have had the vaccine. They yeah. just don't like the mandate. And I think mm. a lot of us are pro-vaccine, but don't like the mandate. I just think, you know, with, with COVID, it sort of showed that when the scientific community and world governments really put their mind to it, they can cure diseases. And it's COVID, they really had to cure it to get the, the world economy back on track and stop, you know, and stop loads of people dying. Mm. So when do they move on to like, when, where's the cure for chlamydia? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've obviously been holding out hope for that one. <laughs> and I sit here in discomfort, yeah. just thinking when. I think just because the world economy can keep spinning with chlamydia. I don't know why you glanced over at me so knowingly when you said that. Yeah. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, a serious story now, and this is a, a really, really dramatic allegation. It's in Saturday's Independent. Leo, tell me more. Yeah, so this is a really, really shocking story. The former Labour peer, Lord Nazir Ahmed, has been jailed uh, for five years and six months uh, for the sexual abuse of two young children. So uh, he's a, he's a um, Labour peer um, and uh, he's 64 years old now. This actually happened when, when he was a teenager. So this happened in the 70s. Um, so it was the attempted rape of a young girl and sexually assaulting a boy under 11 in the 1970s. And the offences took place uh, when Ahmed was a teenager in Rotherham. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's good in a way that, you know, um, the criminal justice system can still deal with historic crimes and bring people to justice. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, criminals can't think that they can get, get away with it. Um, but yeah, really a horrible, uh, horrible case and, you know, lifelong repercussions for the victims. Uh, so in mitigation, his, uh, his QC said Ahmed had devoted his life to public service uh, and uh, his very good reputation that he had has gone. And uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you sexually abused two children. And it's like everybody forgets about the good stuff. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's me trying to make light of it with a flippant joke. Probably not the time and place, but yeah, horrible. It's case. exactly the time and place because yeah. nothing is off limits on this show, but we can all agree a truly horrific crime. Yeah. Um, well, Nick, back to the vaccine, your favourite subject. Yes, I'm getting all the vaccine stories. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know what they're saying about me. But yes, this is a US Army to discharge. I think they're trying to brainwash you. I know. I know. You're being subtly manipulated by our team. <laughs> he will compete. There, like... there will be a live on-air vaccination at some point <laughs> in the next couple of weeks. Anything for ratings, Mark. It'll um, be a global media event. <laughs> we'll finally become number one show on the station. Uh, US Army to discharge unvaccinated soldiers immediately is the story. More than 3,000 soldiers have refused to have the COVID-19 vaccine, even though the US Army, well, this is the time spin, already mandates 17 other jabs. So, yes, I mean, look... Soldiers don't want to have the vaccine. I don't think they should have to. Young people, as Dr. Steve James has told us, young people are not particularly at risk from this. Mm. We know this. They've assessed their risk profile. I mean, obviously, they're open to risk, judging by their job. But they, <laughs> they've decided they don't want this... Um, they don't want this vaccine. And there is something ironic. I mean, ironic. They're protecting freedoms. It's the land of the free. Should they actually have to have the vaccine? <clears throat> this attempt to say, well, they already have to have 17 others, to me, doesn't really work because this is a new vaccine. It's not really the same as those other ones. So I would question that. I think it's just another rubbish Biden policy. We've had this Afghanistan fiasco. 
We've had his gas price fiasco. We've had his vaccine mandate fiasco. Now he's, his administration wants to attack Joe Rogan. So I, I think Biden's been probably the worst president of all time, highly divisive and terrible in all ways. That's me sitting on the fence. But, yeah, so that's it, basically. They, they want to discharge soldiers, soldiers for not having... Well, let's picking up on that Times point, Leo, because, you know, this government, our government, you know, the Sage Advisors, the MHRA... The JCVI, they've all deemed that the vaccine that's available to different age groups is very safe and, of course, fantastic against uh, severe illness and yep. death. Uh, the soldiers have to take other vaccines. What's the problem with the COVID vax? Yeah, I mean, I guess, like Nick says, it's uh, it's a new vaccine. There may be some sort of politicisation, the, the partisan issue uh, coming into where, where it's been become almost a sort of... Uh, uh, the, the vaccine is... Um, is, uh, you know, if you take it, you're bowing down to the Democrat administration who want you to have it. So, you know, that, that's a shame. But I, I kind of hope that, you know, we've had the truckers in Canada. Imagine if the army do a convoy with tanks <laughs> and, like, those, those trucks with the big missiles in the back. That'll be amazing. Nobody's going to mess with that. I mean, yeah. we do... We and also, more... they'll be organised by generals as well. Yeah, it's really efficient. Because generals are really good at roadblocks and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've been watching, like, a war programme on Netflix and <laughs> they're brilliant at it. Yeah, Trudeau's already hiding in a bunker from the truckers, so imagine totally. if they had massive guns. Yeah, exactly. That's yes, that's amazing. Also, I think, I think uh, the Democrat, uh, the Biden mis administration might be missing a trick here to have uh, unvaccinated soldiers as some sort of bioweapon going across <laughs> the border oh, yeah. into, into Russia or into China, because China's, uh, you know, they're, they've got this zero uh, COVID yeah. policy. I'll so, stand near you. Yeah, if you get, yeah we'll get, we're going to come and cough on you. And then <laughs> yeah, you but there stop. might be a few weak chinks in the chain who that have got natural immunity. A terrible. Yeah. Uh, like, that's, a, that's like a Top Gear level joke. Definitely. Well, that was <laughs> certainly unintentional. But then again, what is intentional in life? Moving on, following that philosophical note, the uh, sun uh, are covering a fascinating story. A farmer flipping a car with a forklift. Leo, let's take a look at this clip. I like how he's trying to punch a tractor. That is, <laughs> that is so countryside. And he's just rolling that car. I love this. And look, he's properly trying to kick... Why this, are you trying to kick a JCB? What does he think is going to happen from kicking that JCB? They've missed the best bit. The, the forklift actually knocks that lad over later. It's amazing. Yeah, and that yeah. guy also tried to moon the police. The one. Well, yeah, Leo, tell us the story. Well, yeah, this is the full story. So a farmer who flipped a car off his land, as we just saw with a forklift, he's been cleared after saying he was defending his castle. Uh, he didn't mean like a literal castle, uh, but yeah, the, the farmer Robert Hooper, 57, was captured using the machine to launch the 16,000 pound Vauxhall Corsa. I doubt they paid that much for it. 12, um, 12 max. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. that one looked like it had heated seats and cruise control. But... Yeah, so, so passenger Charlie Burns uh, he's the passenger in the Corsa, not the, not the forklift. Uh, he's 21, who we just saw trying to kick the, the uh, forklift. So we might be dealing with an IQ issue here at the best yeah. of times. <laughs> so he downed up to seven bottles of beer. I think he might have had slightly more than that. He was knocked to the ground by the tractor's lift. And jurors heard how uh, Hooper was aware of an influx of youths loitering, uh, littering, and probably loitering as well, and taking drugs during the summer of last year. Uh, and he'd had, the farmer had had a busy day baling silage and had gone back to the farm for his so tea. So he stank as well. Yeah, <laughs> before planning to... But silage smells nice. That's uh, hay that's... Uh, you didn't grow up in the countryside like I did, but it's hay that's, uh, that's kept, sort of ferments in these... Um, but anyway, uh, it's for, for the cows to eat. You, you think silage smells nice? I think it smells nice. There are worse smells. <laughs> this is, a, this is from a man who wears a T-shirt in February. <laughs> I, uh, I'm wearing. I might have right to now, question but... the parameters of your judgment. <laughs> oh no, maybe I've maybe. So when you you know when you drive through a, a field or drive past a field and it smells of poo, is that not the that's silage? That's not silage. You know, What's that's that? Muck. Oh, that's muck. That's or muck slurry. Spread. Slurry, slurry. Ah. Yeah, so that's muck spreading. So that's, that's cow poo, basically. There you go. Cow feces. But this, uh, which, you know, returns nitrates to the soil. But um, uh, so uh, Burns had been boozing with his pals and he told the court that he was claiming he was, he was intending to walk the 52 miles back home. Which we saw the state of his kicks. He wasn't going to make 52 miles. I worked that out on, on Google Maps. It would take you 17 hours and 20 minutes. So, uh, so he'd be late for his uh, job, job seeker's allowance uh, meeting. So, um, and the, the farmer told the court, he politely asked them to leave as they were blocking access, but he was punched by Burns, that, that guy kicking the, the, um, the tractor. So then, yeah. Do like, you, what what do you up. think this, uh, this verdict means? Is it, is it a like, victory for common sense? This is a victory for common sense. And it suggests, like, if you're going to harass a farmer, make sure he doesn't have a forklift truck. This, this, this farmer deserves his own movie. He knew that the, the police would be nowhere near. It would take them an hour 
power to get there. So he took, he took matters into his own hands. But I don't think we've mentioned that he, he quoted Semaine's case from 1604, which you all know, Mark, was Ed, Edward Coke saying the yeah. house of everyone is to him as his castle and fortress, which is where this house is, the ca your castle thing comes from. It's absolute legend. And he also quoted Mike Tyson. Everyone, <laughs> everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. He literally got punched in the face by this guy. But then his plan changed to let's get in with a fort lift truck. He's an absolute hero. Did he mention the Lion King or, or sing... Um... Can you feel the love tonight? <laughs> yeah, you know, he, he did a quick bit about Peppa Pig. that would Pig, be a but... good show closer, wouldn't it? Or Hakuna Matata, you know? <laughs> let's, uh, let's have 30 seconds on Vladimir Putin in the metro. Oh, yes. Vladimir Putin falls asleep as Ukrainian team walks past at Winter Olympics. So uh, Putin's employed a kind of classic childhood technique here. The, the, the Ukraine people, you know, the, the athletes have been going past, waving their flags and so on. And Putin has just pretended to be asleep rather than acknowledge them in any way as a kind of... It's so passive-aggressive. It's like voting, giving them null points in Eurovision Song Contest. Come on, Putin. Thought you were a man. Do something yeah. manly. Putin's been really cowy. Yeah. He's been a bitch. He is. He really is. He needs a slap. <laughs> and you're the man to do it, Mark. Good luck with that one. How do you deal with Putin? Answers on a postcard, please. So much more to come. I'll be honest, we've saved our best till last. Naked carpenters, super yachts, and Prince Harry apparently has burned himself out. Here's hoping. First up, the weather. Good evening. This weekend will be windy for all and wintry for some, particularly across parts of Scotland. Elsewhere, we're more likely to see a mixture of rain, sleet and hail. This weather front introduced colder air. You'll have noticed that outside today. More weather fronts toppling in will reintroduce slightly milder air, but also bring some wet weather at times too. For most, though, it's going to be dry out there tonight. Still some wintry showers, though, in western Scotland. The snow building up here on some of the higher routes, and it could be quite icy also. Those showers fading for a time before that next set of weather fronts brings more wet weather into western Scotland by dawn. Elsewhere, largely dry, clear. Enough of a wind to stop temperatures dropping too far. Still, it will be a little frosty in rural areas to start the weekend. Frosty, but largely dry and bright across the Midlands, South Wales, Southern England, Eastern England, some sunshine here. But the cloud and the rain will be toppling into Northern England, North Wales, Northern Ireland, and a mixture of rain and some hill snow across Scotland during the morning. That rain will be heavy at times, and it stays windy in this zone as well, so not very pleasant. Across the far north, it may brighten up, but the snow showers will return. Further south, largely dry, uh, but temperatures here could reach double figures. Feeling colder, though, with that wind. It stays windy on Saturday night, and the snow showers returning to parts of northern and western Scotland could cause further disruption. Warning in place here that lasts throughout Sunday. Further south, it will be rain that we see across England and Wales, continuing into Sunday morning, and gradually petering out and pushing south. But a dull, damp start across much of southern England, Brighter skies may be come the afternoon, but uh, again, those snow showers building up across western Scotland. We could see a few centimetres even at low levels by the end of Sunday. Certainly a lot more than that over some of the higher routes. A cold feel across the north, double digits in the south, but everywhere that wind will make it feel colder. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate. From all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories. Make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel. Right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs>
news is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. I'm Mark Dolan. Welcome back to Headliners. Still reacting to tomorrow's newspapers are the premium comedic talents of Nick Dixon and Leo. Hashtag worth every penny curse. <laughs> A story from Saturday's Times now. Leo, tell me about the Scots and their health. Well, yeah, so uh, I feel like the Scottish correspondent for GB News, but uh, this is... Uh, you realise you're story. just... This is a token booking. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, uh, you, you tick a lot of boxes. I, I tick one box. I'm Scottish. Angry Scottish man. I'm uh, Two boxes. I'm angry and I'm Scottish. And, I mean, those two go together anyway. Uh, so it's really just one box. But, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is <laughs> the story in the Times that the poorest Scots spend a third of their lives in bad health. Uh, so you might be shocked to find it's, it's that little. But uh, yeah, this the rest of the time they're sleeping, I guess. This, <laughs> well, they're in very bad health. The rest yeah. of the time. So Scots are living uh, fewer years in good health. The latest figures uh, showing the, the poorest in the country will spend more than a third of their lives in poor health. Between 2018 and 2020, the average healthy life expectancy for men was just over 60 years, while for women it was just over 61 years. Um, so this means that healthy life expectancy has fallen in Scotland for the last four years for women and for the last three for men. So this is a shocking indictment of the SNP's government. I mean, we've just seen, we've seen uh, drug deaths soaring under the SNP. Drug deaths are three and a half times higher than the rest of the UK and Scotland now. Uh, and, you know, even the, it's having such an impact, the average age of coronavirus victims in Scotland is actually older than the average life expectancy, which uh, means that coronavirus, you know, isn't a disease. It's almost like anymore. the elixir of life it's in Scotland. It's an antioxidant, yeah. Like, it's, <laughs> Scottish life expectancy is so bad that, you know, uh, you can actually introduce a bat virus into the Scottish diet and people live longer. Uh, so it's crazy. Oh, it's, a, it's a lab now. Do keep up. Yeah, well, this, this is, uh, I mean, this, is, this maybe comes back to the independence vote, because the SNP want independence. So uh, they, they said last time it was a once in a generation uh, vote. So maybe they're thinking if people, if they can get the, the healthy life expectancy down far enough, you know, down, you know, sort of to, to like seven years or something, uh, they can have more votes. Like yeah, that. well, everyone's going to be a student voter, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, they're going to have to be because they're going to be dead by the time they graduate. You're just some sort of elderly 17-year-olds walking around with a stick. Yeah. Well, imagine how bad the health's going to be as well when they can't take all our money when they're independent. Have you thought about that? Our money? Yeah, England's money when you guys leave and you can't take all our money from London. Stop saying it like that. I, mean, well, I know you're right, but it makes me want to punch you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I love was, the way it's Leo's fault. I thought it was, thought it was good banter, yeah. but I almost got punched by a Scottish person. That's, oh, that's identity Scotland. politics. You're going to start saying, as a Scottish person. Yeah, you went really woke there, Leo. Listen, I didn't, I didn't, like, the SNP, you, you guys brought, you guys invented devolution. That was a terrible idea. It's just created these satellite, it was satellite parliaments that fight against the centre. So you should think about what you did there. Leo, Sorry. as an angry Scottish man, curse. Let's move on to the Daily Mail now and a story about a young man getting torn apart by Fiona Bruce. Yes, Nick. well, Leo's the Scottish correspondent. I'm the anti-vax correspondent. <laughs> and you're on a vaccine hat-trick tonight. <laughs> yeah, here we go for the hat-trick. Daily Mail, the philo this philosophy graduate was torn down on question time after claiming the COVID jab is more dangerous than the virus for young people. So this was a typical BBC stitch-up. Uh, which the Daily Mail have gone along with because they're on the sort of hating people who are sceptical of the vaccine train as well. They're calling him an anti-vaxxer. We don't know if he's an anti-vaxxer. I think the Mail have been quite balanced about the, the pandemic overall, though, haven't they? Well... For example, they ran an article this week about why the media didn't draw attention to a new report from economists yeah, yeah, in America yeah. saying that the uh, restrictions saved 0.2% of lives. They're hit and miss. They, they've said some good things. They've smeared uh, people who are sceptical of the vaccine. They smeared mm. the Canadian truckers. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm less wait 50 -50. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So, but this, if you saw the clip, what it was, a, a young philosophy student was in the audience at, at question time 
And he sort of, ch he challenged the guy who was on the show, I can't remember his name now, sorry, but he was an expert on the show. But the, the oh, it was, uh, was it Robin Shattuck? Anyway, th the thing was- Robin did what? <laughs> Professor That's a Robin bad symptom. Shattuck, I think. Did he? But, Poor guy. But what happened <laughs> Was is, he seen by anyone? <laughs> this is a, That's live TV. Yeah, this is, um, the point, it's a serious thing, Mark. The point is, I know it's a comedy show, but it's a very serious point. He, light and shade. It's light and shade. This, tried... this program's like an episode of Only Fools and Horses. Big laughs and a couple of tears in the middle. All he did, right, he, he criticised, he, he was sceptical about the vaccine. Then Fiona Bruce said, well, hang on, we've got the expert here. And the philosophy student said, I've been taught not to go with that because that's an appeal to authority, meaning a logical mm. fallacy where you just say, well, this is an expert. And he goes, if I was going to do the same, I could cite Dr. Robert Malone, the inventor of the vaccine. That's the only place he slipped because Malone's actually the inventor of the mRNA technology or one of the inventors, you could Correct. say. He's he has nine patents. Nine patents Thank on you. It. So, the Mail have smeared this guy by saying um, I, he, he, that he um, claimed that studying philosophy had taught him to question authority. No wrong Mail. He was saying an appeal to authority. It was a completely different thing. So what they did, and the host of the show, is it really up to the host of the show on Question Time to just say, actually, that's wrong, you know, that he didn't invent the vaccine, we've got the expert here, you're an idiot. They stitched up this audience member to make him look like an idiot and make the vaccine skeptical position look weak. Why not just have someone else on the panel, another expert like Robert Malone, and let them debate it? How about that? That would be like a great Joe Rogan, idea. Which but... is why people love Joe Rogan and are going off the BBC. They do. Uh, Leo? It's just like a Facebook, it's every Facebook argument for the last two years, but they've just transposed it to question time. Yeah, which is, oh, where's your degree in epidemiology? Yeah. Well, it's like, well, I don't have a degree in epidemiology, but I've noticed that Sweden didn't have lockdowns and fewer people died. Yeah. So I don't know whether I've got enough critical judgment to think that that might be a story. Yeah. That, all, all that the... Maybe that could provoke a discussion about the efficacy of lockdowns because yeah. Sweden, brackets, did not lock down. Yeah, Sweden didn't lock down. Britain didn't lock down hugely compared to a lot of other places. And mm. Britain, Britain did came out pretty well. Especially England. <laughs> Freedom England. <laughs> Freedom! No sense of humour about that issue at all, have you? Comedians, none of them have a sense of humour. I think we learnt that tonight. Saturday's Times has a story about Jeff Bezos and a super yacht. This is the Amazon owner, isn't it? Yeah, this is Jeff Bezos is uh, building this enormous yacht, uh, one of the world's biggest. Uh, it's called Y721, which is quite a, quite a nerdy name for a yacht. I thought they always had names like, you know, the flying... Duchess or something like that. That's right, like the that. Princess that of the Seas. Princess of the Seas, that's a better The one. Flying Duchess yeah. is an adult movie from the mid-70s. <laughs> and she literally flies. Right, good. You've seen it. I've got a grainy copy. I can uh, <laughs> maybe, show it maybe, to you sometime. Maybe Boris will reference it next in one of his... Boris uh, is in it. Mia Culpas is Boris in it. Cameo. <laughs> I'm not entirely uh, surprised. Uh, but yeah, so this, this uh, yacht... Um, is said to have cost 430 million euros. I'm not sure why he's having it made in euros <laughs> instead of in dollars. Uh, and it's going to be the largest three-masted schooner in the world. I thought we were the largest three-masted schooner in the world. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right there. Did you, was it too big to buy on Amazon Prime, do you think? It's too big. It won't uh, fit through a letterbox and it can't be hidden underneath, underneath a wheelie. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's being built... Um, it's being, basically, it's being built inland in Holland, which seems to be a bad place to build a massive ship because you've then got to get it from inland to outland. Where's your degree in shipbuilding? Well, I, I, in the last topic, we had to be vaccine experts. Now we're experts in shipbuilding. Actually, I'm Scottish. We built loads of ships. Correct. Connolly. Loads of like welding, all that kind of stuff. Um, and people are upset because they're going to have to dismantle a bridge. There's some poxy old bridge in Rotterdam uh, that people used to walk across and get to the other side of Rotterdam. Busy bodies. And forget why they went there in the first place. So these busy bodies are saying that Jeff Bezos shouldn't... Well, obviously, he's going to pay for it because he's, he's dead rich. Uh, D Jeff Bezos shouldn't be allowed to dismantle this bridge to get, get his yacht out so it can go in the water. Uh, and like this person says, so this is a, a green left councillor uh, called Stefan Lewis. Um, he says, this man has earned his money by structurally cutting staff, evading taxes, avoiding regulations, and now we have to tear down our beautiful national monument. This really is a bridge too far, which is probably a pun that works uh, in, in Dutch as well as in English. So uh, I think this is really unfair. I mean, Jeff Bezos has generated billions upon billions in, in value for, uh, for workers, for shareholders. There's 1.7 million Amazon sellers. These are people effectively, small businesses, uh, 
sell via Amazon. They've got their, their livelihoods. They make a lot of money. He's generated over $1 trillion in shareholder value. And when we talk about shareholder value, people say, oh, but it's rich people getting richer. No, this is pension funds and Correct. You know, university endowments and things like that. And plus all, all the jobs he's generated and all the you know convenience and benefits he's generated for the consumers that he helps. Well. Uh, so I think it's really unfair. Uh, to, to be slamming him. So like this. I think he's a hero. I think they should. I think they should definitely let him. They should rename that when bridge, you're a, when the you, Jeff Bezos Bridge. I think it's a great idea. When you're a billionaire, it's your job to have bridges dismantled to accommodate your ship. Well, shall I give the other side that? I mean, look, the, the proposal on the Facebook group was that they'd all throw eggs at the yacht, which is a kind of a great microcosm of our society, throwing eggs at the 1%. You know, this is kind of where we are. One guy with obscene wealth, the other people sort of resenting it with a futile gesture. Someone even suggested they go down with pa a paper bag filled with poop, which is not, <laughs> not the best use of your day. I mean, I hate to sound all Tory here. We've already got Leo, but you could argue that Bezos is in the position he's in because he didn't spend his days throwing poop at people. And they could, you know, they could start an online business, for example, and it was a, but it was a touch arrogant the idea of dismantling this sort of uh, historic bridge. Then again, apparently it, there's no applications even been made for that yet. But yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of on the fence because yes, it's probably not the best use of your day to throw eggs at Bezos. But then yeah. again, I don't well, know. look, I apparently uh, Bezos is not happy with the ship, but he's got 28 days to send it back. Nice. <laughs> That's why you're the host. Because it package it up <laughs> and make sure it, it doesn't look like he's used it. You got to wipe it dry with a towel. <laughs> Um, look, let's power through a couple of others if we can, chaps. So we're against the clock, but how about this? A clip involving the actor Tandy Newton in Saturday's Independent, Nick. Yes, I'm sorry that I'm the one chosen. Tandy Newton apologises to darker-skinned actresses for not representing them. So, in a nutshell, since we're against the clock, she basically apologised for getting loads of great acting roles throughout her career and said, I'm sorry I keep getting these acting roles, which is a bizarre thing to say, because when you go for an acting role, you're desperately hoping to get it, especially if it's in a big movie. Yeah. But she's saying she's sorry she got it. And uh, look, and people have had a pop at her because she, she cries on cue. She's a, she's a great actor. Um, but yeah, I can understand if you're a sort of, I'm going to be, give both sides. If you're a sort of darker skinned black person, you're saying, why does Tandy Newton get all the roles? You could be annoyed about it. Then again, it's this kind of woke obsession with, you know, with skin, colour and identity. I mean, look, it's not that bad that Tandy Newton got the roles. Her mum was black. What is the big problem? We aren't talking about playing pretend after all. Yeah. Well, I feel bad. I'd like to apologise to all of those tall, specky people out there that aren't in broadcasting. How about this? In the Metro, Prince Harry. Burnt out, Leo, here's yeah, hoping. I mean, I'd first like to apologise to comedians who are more Scottish than me. But yeah, uh, Prince, Harry, <laughs> Prince Harry's opened up about how he experienced burnout and previously described feeling like he was getting to the very end of everything that he had. Well, he will if he's still spending money at the same rate as a prince. Uh, so, yeah, the Duke, he's, he's told, um, he's, he's made these comments during a live stream about this uh, mental health company he set up. Uh, he was alongside Serena Williams, because uh, when, you, when you're uh, Prince Harry, you've, it's important to have a black friend. But the, the Duke told viewers <laughs> about the importance of self care. I mean, I hate to say the word masturbation again, but isn't that a, a explicitly a <laughs> euphemism for this? But yeah, burnt out. Burnt out, oh, Prince Harry. Were you burnt out? Burnt out from telling your butler to book a private room at the Wolseley. Burnt out from like getting the nanny to raise your children. Burnt out from getting in a limo to, to go and do another <laughs> interview with Oprah. Come on, try getting a proper job. Try working. Try working a proper job, like driving a bus or being a postman or something. Then we'll see who's now burnt Now you're out. talking. Being exactly. On yeah. Yeah. Hard work. Uh, how about this then? Let's, uh, let's finish on a carpenter if we can. Oh. A oh, naughty yeah. carpenter. This is your I love this Leo. story. Yeah, this is yeah, this is me. So uh, this is a naturist who was once dubbed the naked carpenter because he's a carpenter and he doesn't have any clothes on. Uh, so he's lost his appeal against a conviction for walking through a town centre at night wearing see-through trousers. I remember Iggy Pop did this on the Word and uh, didn't get into into trouble. Uh, so Robert Jenner, 47, you can see him on the on the screen yeah. there. He's, that's he's not naked. helping, is it? That's yeah, not that's, helping his case. There's one for the housewives there. Yeah, yeah and just for anyone listening on the radio, he's naked, but he's wearing a tool belt around his private parts. Yeah, covering his tool. And he was stopped by police <laughs> uh, dressed in black mesh trousers, which revealed his buttocks and genitals. Um, so he, <laughs> to, to, to add to this, uh, he'd worn uh, the transparent garment without underwear to go drinking in a nearby Weatherspoons. So making it kind of less remarkable for uh, what happened in the Weatherspoons that night. And it, well, and it yeah. said he was already in prison for what he described as another one of these. So he <laughs> yeah. does quite a few of them. And oh apparently he just put some trousers on. And he even says on two occasions when he exposed himself, okay. it was snowing. I don't know why we need that. <laughs> there you go. Uh, if you do uh, any DIY naked, just be careful where you leave your spanner.
<laughs> my sincere thanks to my wonderful panel tonight, Leo Kurs and Nick Dixon. I told you they were marvelous and they've proved it. They're back very, very soon. I'll be back in the hot seat tomorrow at nine o'clock and headliners at 11. Thanks for your company. Keep it GB News. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why